here we go. Okay, well, welcome everyone to Creativity 101 um, with our esteemed alumni, Zara Stasi, class of 2012. Um, I'm thrilled to kick off the event tonight. My name is Catherine Covino. Um, I'm also from the class of 2012, and I am the president of our DC alumni chapter. Um, I want to thank our other board members in the DC Alumni Chapter and the Alumni Association for helping us get tonight's event organized, as well as the other virtual events that we are um, creatively coming up with during this um, interesting time. Um, as you probably noticed, you are all muted. Um, that's the best way we decided for an event with over 100 participants, but throughout the event, you can um, type any questions that you have for Zara in the chat, and we will be doing Q&A at the end, and any questions that we don't get to, um, Zara has kindly offered to follow up on afterwards. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce Zara, um, my really good friend, um, sorority sister, former colleague at Deloitte, uh, classmate, as I mentioned, um, even one of my wedding vendors with her beautiful creativity. Um, I actually, thinking through, you know, when I first met Zara, realized that we met probably the first week of classes. We were in the same freshman seminar covering great migrations within the history department. Um, and I'm just thrilled with all that she has accomplished. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Zara. Thanks, Kat. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Zara. Hopefully you can see me and my slides. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And thanks for spending a little bit of time on your Thursday evening with me, Kat, and the Wayne Mary alumni crew. Um, I know people will be trickling in, but I think we should just jump in and get started, as Kat did. So what I will do is um, first start by saying, this is Creativity 101. It's a guide to daily creativity. And I'm going to first tell you a little bit about my story. Kat alluded to a couple of the points of it, but it really is a story that's about kind of following your creativity and what interests you. And I think it'll help us with our exercises later. So. That's me. Um, uh, as I mentioned, and um, as Kat mentioned, I'm an alumni, class of 2012. And as you can see here, this is kind of a visual map of my journey since William & Mary. So on the left-hand side, you can see some of the things I was interested or involved in on campus. Um, I was an art history major and a history, uh, art and history double major, very different than art history major. Um, but you'll see some other things. I did study abroad in Italy. I was a Chi Omega, as Kat mentioned, sorority sister. I gave tours of the Wren Building through the Spotswood Society. I had a lot of different interests. Um, and I think as a liberal arts student, a lot of us felt like we could follow those paths around William and Mary and um, many of the things that they offered us as, as a college campus. And there have been times in my life where that was a problem, where people were like, you know, you're interested in too many things, or you really shouldn't be focused on this many things. Um, but I never really felt that way on campus when I was among Boy Mary uh, students, because we all kind of were like that. We all had a couple things we were really interested in. And so for me, curiosity and kind of figuring out what I liked was a huge part of William Mary. And that stayed with me through my time as I left William and Mary and worked at Deloitte. So for those of you who aren't maybe familiar, Deloitte 
um, Deloitte Consulting in DC is a consulting company that does a lot of different work with a lot of different clients. And I, an art major, got a job there right after I graduated. And um, some people are surprised by that. But one of the reasons I feel, and I was told that I was um, looked at as a candidate, was because I had a very different background. So as an art major, there were things that I was used to doing all the time that the business world found value in. So things like sitting in an art class and observing a model for hours just to draw one picture, that was a real asset when you came to needing to observe and really focus in on key business processes to figure out gaps and uh, opportunities. So there were a lot of things like that, which I, as a senior, maybe did not recognize or realize, but I was interested in finding a job, financial security, and really seeing the world. And so Deloitte was a really great partner for me at the time. So um, when I went to Deloitte, as you can see kind of on the right-hand side of this visual, um, I came in through strategy and consulting, and I spent a couple years doing consulting work in DC. And I was very good at it, but I didn't love it. And I think that's a really important distinction. I wasn't putting kind of my all into it, even though on paper it was going well. And once I noticed that, I kind of stopped and wanted to reflect and say, well, why don't I love it? What, what am I missing? And I found that my love of art, which you know, was with me before William and Mary, during and, and still with me after, wasn't showing up in my day-to-day -day job. And so I had a couple options, you know, I could just quit, go back, go to art school, I could quit and find a whole new job, I could, you know, there's all these things that run through your head, but I said, you know, let me just see if there's anything at this company that'll give me what I'm looking for. And so I kind of took a couple months to start searching, you know, what's out there, what trainings could I take, things like that. And I took a training that was around visual capture. And Many of you are probably like, I've never heard of that. I had never heard of it either, but it's a tool for facilitated sessions that helps visualize what people are talking about in real time. And the tool is humans. You know, we are the ones who learn it and do it. And I was hooked. I took a training. I started to practice every day after work. I'd volunteer and say, could I please come to your meeting and do some live capture? Because I knew that I was interested in it and it was a nice connection of the art and the business that I was learning. Um, and I ended up doing it a lot, thought I was great. Looking back at my work then, it was rough, but at the time I thought it was excellent. And sometimes you just have to be your biggest fan, even though looking back, would I have hired me to do that work? Maybe not, but that's okay because we all grow and that's important. So anyway, I was at Deloitte, I'm in consulting. I found this new skill and I'm like, how do I get this to be my job? Cause this is, it. everyone wanted it for their sessions, but it wasn't a full-time role. So I was still doing two jobs. And so I started asking around and I asked, you know, my boss's boss's boss with my little portfolio, do you have a role for this? And they said, you know, not right now, but you might want to check with the greenhouse. Um, the greenhouse at Deloitte is a facilitation group that works with clients to design like whole days about their problem. And they work the client through their problem with all these different design techniques. And I was like, okay, like, let me try it out there. So I pitched my, my story there and I ended up getting a job at that group in their global greenhouse group. So I was the first team member hired to do these sessions, things that where we work with our clients, we understand what they are going through and we design a day around it, but only globally. So as someone who had only traveled a couple times, uh, mostly, you know, in college and with family here and there abroad, I was really interested in the opportunity to go to places I'd never been before. And it never crossed my mind to be worried about it because I was so excited to try this new creative thing, even though it wasn't a full-time job. And so I took the job, I did the work, and every time I was in a session, which you can imagine, you know, a workshop, there's 20 or 30 people, you're working towards a strategy or a goal, everyone's a little bit different. Um, but the added complexity of doing it globally was that no one, there wasn't really just one language that was spoken in the room. There were many languages represented. And I found myself 
picking up the pen or the marker in the room and starting to plot visually what we were talking about. Something that I learned, you know, the year before and had practiced, but now I was doing it in kind of high stakes situations, you know, where people really were needing that as a tool to understand what was going on. And it was really thrilling for me because the moment I picked up the pen, I was kind of back in my art classroom, like at Lake Metoica, like totally in the flow state, like two hours into a four hour class where you don't even pay attention to everything that's going along. You just paying attention to what you're working on. And that's kind of that flow state I found when I was doing uh, visual capture. And so I loved it. I did it as much as I could. And I got a lot of great feedback from the client saying, this was the most impactful part of our session, really being understand to understand the story and where we're going, where we've been, kind of all the things that come with visualizing something in real time. So what I decided was after I had done that job for about a year, again, on top of my regular job of just being a designer and someone that facilitates these sessions, I wanted to do it full time. And I felt like I had enough examples and uh, client feedback that I pitched yet again uh, to my boss at the time. And I said, this needs to be a full-time role where we use art as a tool in business settings. And the reason we use art is because it's something everyone can see and experience and be a part of, but it has all of these superpowers that we haven't even cracked yet. And I created kind of a career that I thought on paper, you know, this is how I'll spend my time and this is what I'll do. And she said, yes. And she said, let's pilot this. We'll give it six months, see where we are in six months. And we never really came back to check in because it was going so well and there was so much of a need and an interest for this tool to kind of augment and support the sessions that we were doing. So I say all of that because it's really important to my story that you know, I had to go to a place that really didn't have any art in it um, and see how I could bring my full self there, which was through art and through visuals to see the value of that tool and how it impacted the work we were doing. So I did that for about five years. I ended up having a small team of people I would train. I ended up going, you know, globally and training over 400 people across the world in visual capture. I worked with you know, some of the most in, you know, important clients to Deloitte and with the most strategic kind of messy problems, sometimes one-on-one -on -one with a CEO or CFO, you know, me drawing on my iPad and them telling me you know, why that visual is wrong or why we need um, you know, more um, visualization here or kind of working through their exact problem in real time. And it was really thrilling and it was really great, um, but I felt like I was kind of hitting a plateau. I was very much defined my, by my creativity at Deloitte and I had team members and individuals that would approach me all the time for kind of coaching and help. Like, how do I find my creativity? How do I find what I like to get good at and I'm passionate about? Um, how do I get better at these skill sets, et cetera? And so at that time I started to reflect on like, what my creative creativity was coming from and where it was coming from inside and what I wanted to do with it next. And when I was reflecting on where it was coming from, I found two streams. I found the art side. So what I did at William and Mary, like I mentioned before, the really kind of intensive observation days where you're just looking at a model for hours, you're working on one drawing and then guess what? You come back tomorrow and you work again on the same model same four hours, multiple weeks in a row. Um, so that was one thing, that kind of observation and really kind of digging into a problem. That was really important to me. And I was like, I get a lot of energy from that. And then I thought, what else? And I thought, okay, well, at, you know, in, as an art major, you do a lot of critiques. You put all your work up on the wall that you are currently working on. And it gets, you know, ripped to shreds by your classmates and your professor. And people are like, okay, what story were you trying to tell here? I don't really see it. Um, you know, you're saying one thing, but your painting saying another, right? And it's that disconnect between what you're creating and what people take from it. So I got a lot of energy from kind of getting knocked down and having to get back up multiple times throughout my life with those kind of critiques and saw so much value in the questions that get asked in those critiques. But also from business, there was a ton that I was learning from about creativity. So a big side of it was, 
uh, really listening to conversations that I was in, in in these rooms and looking for patterns. And those patterns help me visualize things in real time because they're cues. You know, when you hear the same word or multiple words um, that mean the same thing over and over and over, if you're the one person who's really listening, you're going to learn something that everyone in the room has just bypassed, right? Because they're used to the language that they use in their job or they're used to the way they talk about their problems. So I had that kind of unique outsider's view, but also someone that was looking all the time. So I think that that was really impactful for me when I was thinking about um, how to really take this to the next level. And then the last thing was um, learning about environments and behavior and how they impact each other. So how we would design a room one way and that would drive conversation one way or the other, right? A circle drives very different conversation than kind of stadium seating as an example. And so anyway, that's a long way to say that I kind of outgrew where I was, but I didn't outgrow my interest in art as a tool. So art as a tool was something I wanted to explore further. And last year I left Deloitte and started my own creative studio, as you see on the top corner there, um, called Good for the Bees. And that is a creative studio based here in New York, where I am right now, um, that really is, is focused on using art as a tool to help people thrive. So what I will do here is click through, okay? So um, here's a little bit about the things I offer in this new studio. And it's important to me because these are categories that kind of bubbled up while I was working at Deloitte in some capacity or things I worked at on way before Deloitte. But I wanted to really focus on expanding who I was reaching with these things. So who I was reaching with visual capturing you know, the type of conversations that really need to be visualized and really need a lot of people to be able to look at and say, you know what, that is important. That is interesting. Or I've never seen it that way. I never you know, thought of someone's other side in that way until I saw it visualized. Murals, so the idea of creating space with art and taking space that exists and repurposing it with simply a couple, you know, colors of paint. Illustration, the idea of actually telling your story as a client through small bite-sized illustration. You know, we see visuals all the time in our life now, especially on screens but the idea of really honing in and helping to tell a really concrete story with a couple of visuals. And I don't have to do that real time, so it's much easier. And then painting, which is really the idea of creating a piece that brings joy to someone and they purchase it or you know, would like to purchase it because of that joy that it brings them. So connecting those dots there. And what I really thought about when I started the business was, you know, I had things I wanted to do. I kind of went backwards. Um, they, everyone always says, you know, have five or 10 clients that want your work right away. I didn't have that many. I had a, a real burning passion knowing like, this is important, everyone's gonna want it, and had some areas I wanted to work with. And so I say that because, you know, everyone starts their business or their career or their journey in different ways. I started this with just a, just a pure passion of this is important, people need to know this, and I'm going to bring it to them. So I'll, the next slide is about some of the clients I work with now, a year and change in. And I bring that up because A, William and Mary is on there, and I'll show you an example of something I did with them last year. But B, there's a clear diversity in these clients, right? They're all, you know, they have different stakeholders, interests, things that they're working on. And I think that's important because it shows that art as a tool and the creativity that drives that you know, theme is really agnostic of industry and client. So I'll go to the next slide. And this is one piece of what I did with William and Mary last year. So the William and Mary folks on the phone and on the call will know that convocation is a really big deal at William and Mary. And so last year, um, convocation, as we know, is the, the beginning of the school year for William and Mary. And we usually invite alums back to speak about it and speak about their time and what they've learned. So here's a small visual capture snippet of Beth Comstock, an alum, her story that she shared and her insights she shared last year at Convocation. So as you can see, there's different levels of information, you know, the, the green categories of 
make room for discovery and the hand at the top and the own your own story at the bottom. Those are kind of the big takeaways, but then there's content peppered in among and around those takeaways, which is very much important as well. And so what's interesting about this is it was part of a suite of kind of illustrations that I helped create and that we shared online to help people who weren't there feel like they kind of understood the story and for people who were there to really understand and kind of retain what was shared. And here's just a couple other visuals and pieces of work so you get a sense of the type of work I do and just it's very varied and there's a lot of variety to it but I think you'll probably see a little bit of a thread through each piece there. Um, what I will say next is that this is probably going to be a shocking slide for some people on the call because they joined this because they're like, you know, I want to be more creative or I want to understand my creativity, but I'm not creative. And what I say to that is, no, you are creative. And it may be shocking for you to say that or hear that, but know that you are creative because all of us have our own creativity. And you are creative it's I'm creative, you're creative, like we all have our own creativity because it's very much about us and our what's going on inside and how we bring that to solve problems on the outside. So a lot of people on the internet and in books have defined creativity in different ways. And when I went to think about how I wanted to do this practice today, I had to really almost redefine it for myself because there's a lot of conflicting stuff out there. You know, creativity is when you use your imagination to make a painting or a piece of art, creativity is solving a problem. You know, there's so many different things, but for me, it's about how you think. It's about solving tasks. It's about solving problems. Um, it's about the necessity of the everyday and needing to be creative in our everyday life, as well as those times where we really stretch and have the ability to think broadly and maybe invent or create um, on different levels. And so, for me, one thing I want to share is that my creativity is not the same as your creativity because we have different experiences, we have different skill sets, we have different interests, and that does not mean one is better than the other. And a lot of people take, you know, take moments to think about, well, I'm not really creative because I don't paint, or I'm not really creative because I can't draw. But I'm here to tell you that that doesn't matter at all, at all, because creativity is about how you pull something from your past to really inform new and bold and novel things. So my definition, my simplified definition that I made up on my own, and I hope no one steals it, but they probably will, uh, is as follows. Creativity is the act of pulling from your experiences to create something new. And again, it's incredible that we have different experiences and that's why we pair so well when we're put on teams together, right? When you work with someone and you're on a creative kind of collaboration, you don't come from the exact same space. And that's what probably makes you much more effective as a team than if you were both the exact same person. So creativity needs diversity to really be as strong as it can be. And this definition helps me think about it personally because I really do think your experiences and what you put yourself through, what you practice, really drives your own creativity. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I also want to mention that creativity is definitely the skill of the future. So it's also the skill of the now because we're always kind of in the future. But if you Google, you know, any number of job sites or listings, you'll see creativity is always included as a skill set that folks are looking for when they're looking for new employees or they're looking for uh, new work to show, et cetera. So it's not that creativity is that class you have to go take so you can check the box on the skill set. It's really about how do you think and how do you bring your thinking to the problem or the task at hand. So we'll work through the three activities soon um, that you can do as many times as you want over and over, but just know that they're just three different ways to really start to crack at your own creativity. And before we get there, there's a commonality to creativity and what it really means across all the activities you could ever do that help you feel creative. Um, so this is kind of like the grounding slide on how do you unlock your creativity? You do things that pique your curiosity, help you deeply observe something, 
and then you repeat whatever you're doing over and over and over until you find some insights. And I should mention these slides um, are all going to be sent to you after this. So if you're taking notes, excellent, but don't feel like you have to. Um, but the, the underlying piece through all three of these things that help unlock your creativity is trust. And this is important because I've given similar talks before or chatted about creativity with individuals and they get very anxious. They're like, well, I have a meeting tomorrow and my boss is looking for three creative ideas. So when will I get those ideas, right? Like if I do your activities, like when do they come? And the answer there is really about trusting yourself because these are not kind of um, one and done activities. They are not transactional. They're really iterative. And you have to really start to practice your own creativity and really start to feel out how you respond to things and what you're interested in, your curiosity, because that's going to drive the solutioning or the invention or the, the kind of bigger ahas that creativity might bring you and you have to trust that you'll get there and that you'll stay kind of vigilant to getting there but I, I just bring that up because it helps me when I think about you know oh I changed my environment I did all these things I practiced and did everything by hand but like I still have no great idea about how to bridge this gap you have to trust that it'll come and you almost have to give yourself some extra space to think about your creativity and what you're learning for those ideas to come. Okay, what we've all been waiting for. So these are the three activities I'm going to bring us through today. And for the first one, we're going to need paper and maybe a pencil or a pen. So I'll let everyone kind of take a moment and get those. Um, I should also mention that if you have any questions, uh, putting them in the chat is excellent and Kat is going to look through them and at the end we're going to have some time for Q&A. So if you do have questions as I'm going through the work, um, feel free to ask them and then I don't know if people have been asking them, I'm not looking, but, um, but know that we'll get to them and if not, I'll get to them after the session. So, um, blind contour drawing is our first activity. So these are blind contour drawings. Now everyone take like a really good look, like get close to your screen because you probably can't tell what any of these things are. And that's kind of the point. These are drawings that are very like age old art school techniques. The blind contour drawing is very much like what it sounds. You draw something, the contours of something without looking at your paper. Okay. So what I will share now is kind of the, the middle picture on the bottom. Those are leaves. So that was a blind contour I made using my pen on paper of some leaves in my apartment. The idea of the blind contour is your eye and your pen are basically one. So what I mean by that is when you look at the edge of a leaf, your pen starts drawing that edge of the leaf. And when you keep going around the edge, your pen keeps drawing it. It's slow, it's all about the process, and obviously it's not about the outcome. But what's incredible about blind contour drawings and why art schools use them is it's a tool to help people look. It's a tool to help you really observe something without pretense of, am I getting it right? Am I drawing it correctly? On the bottom left-hand corner, I don't know if anyone can guess what that is, but these are multiple blind contours of my husband, Andy, as he's reading in the park. So some of them you might be able to see, yeah, it's a book, or oh, that looks like a sunglass line. But some of them are like totally, no one probably could guess what it is. But that's the point. You know, as I was doing those blind contours, I'm not looking at my, my notepad. I'm just observing Andy. And I'm just observing kind of every edge of Andy, every line, every hat, every hair. And so that's what the blind contour is really about. You pick an object you see it, you observe it, you draw that object without looking at your paper. That is important. The speed is important. You're going slow. You're not seeing an orange and just drawing a circle. You're going across the edge of that orange and you do not pick up your pen. So even if there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, you try to retrace or go back, don't pick up your pen, but finish your drawing. And you see a little illustration here of someone using a mirror to do a blind contour. And that's actually one of the best ways of practice because A, um, 
it's your face. And as much as you think you look at it all the time, you really don't. Um, and it's always changing. It's always different. And B, it's always with you. So you could always kind of do it no matter what, even if you're just, you know, you just need a mirror for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab our pen and our paper and we're going to do a 30 second blind contour drawing. So what you need for this, you need to have your pen and your paper and you need to pick something in your room. So if you're sitting next to someone else, you could pick them. It's a really great way to, uh, you know, observe someone and kind of empathize with each other. And you could always switch, you know, do 30 seconds, you draw me, 30 seconds, I draw you. It's a tool I use many times in facilitation with like C-suite executives. And they're so uncomfortable at the beginning. And by the end, they're like, wow, I never looked at my, my you know, VP of sales like that before we really connected. So what you do is you grab an object, something in the room that you can see. I'm gonna do a timer on my clock. And what we're gonna do is a 30 second blind contour drawing. It's gonna feel uncomfortable, but we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, can I get like a verification that, you know, people have their pen and paper, just kind of wave it so I can see some of them. Okay, great, excellent. All right, so I'm gonna put 30 seconds on the clock. I'll give you a couple more seconds to find something. Okay. All right, 30 seconds on the clock and I'll let you know when it's up. Blind contour. I'm doing it too. Okay, I went way over uh, our time, but that's okay because I wasn't looking at my phone either. All right, so what I'll ask you to do is put your blind contour drawing up like this. Just so everyone can get a sense of how it's not about the drawing, it's about the process. Let's see. Yes, okay. Excellent. Kat's struggling to get her picture in. Okay, so. The background doesn't let me. <laughs> so. What you can see in all of your colleagues' work here is, you know, if I drew this aloe plan while looking at it, I probably would have needed 10 seconds, right? And it wouldn't have been perfect, but you'd know what I was doing. It's a different skill set, right? Like it's a different process. What we were doing is we were looking and drawing. And the thing about blind contours, you can do it and work it into your routine. Sometimes I like to do it in the morning when I have my coffee. So I have my journal, which I kind of journal in if I feel like I need to. I sometimes just write the date and I do a blind contour. It might be of the bookshelf, it might be of my coffee mug. It's not about what it's of, it's really about practicing and the process of really focused observation. Because that is gonna help you think about different solutions, different ideas, different inventions, et cetera, that's gonna come from looking at that glass every day and letting your mind kind of get into a flow state and realizing, you know what, on day five, that one thing I've been thinking about every morning, like I kind of have an idea for it now, right? It's just the process to get your brain in a different place, a slower place that's focused on observation. So that's the blind contour. And I have plenty of other examples I can share if anyone's interested, just let me know. Uh, some that are like very bad, bad quote, but are great and I love. All right, next one, color of the day. So this activity, as you can see maybe here, is about picking one color and spending the whole day on high alert for that color. When you see it, photographing it. So what's great about this is it's, a, it's not necessarily about the color so much as it's about training your brain to look for patterns. So if it's Monday and I want yellow to be my color, you see here there's flowers from a walk, 
There's a picture from a Madeline book. There's, you know, one of my throw um, blankets is yellow. My raincoat is yellow, right? So you see some of the same, um, not perfect, but shades, right, of yellow. And what's important about this is it's really about unlocking the part of your brain that is looking for patterns. Because as we all know, a lot of solutions, a lot of uh, big ideas come from noticing a pattern and responding to it. And so patterns and looking for them are kind of tough though. So you have to give your brain kind of a trigger or an idea like today it's blue. We're looking for navy blue. And this is an activity you can do alone, personally, you know, never share your photos with anyone. Or it can be something your family does. It could be something you and your friend who lives in London do together, right? Like this week, we're looking for yellow. And you can share your photos. And the reason I say that is people, even with a simple photo of yellow throughout the day, right? right? Like if I go back, even if this was yellow and everyone got the same prompt, look for yellow, it'd be completely different photos, right? Like it wouldn't be, we wouldn't have the same kind of grid of photos. So what's really interesting about it is documenting each sighting with a picture, not only documents the color, triggers your brain, but it helps you create like a new way of telling your story of the day. It's kind of like, this was my journey. Here, 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 and here. What's great about this activity is you do not change your schedule, right? Like this isn't something that you're like, oh, Zara said to do color of the day on Monday and it's Monday and I have no time for it, right? It happens with your schedule. If you're commuting to work or if you're working from home, you know, like that morning activity, right? You're getting your coffee. Is there yellow anywhere? Uh, you're starting your first meeting. You're looking around your workspace. Oh, I didn't even realize I have yellow slippers, right? Like they're, they, it's more about that activity of I'm curious, I'm looking for it, but it's kind of creating a reason to look. And the color of the day is a really easy way to do that. Um, it's also fun for me because I personally share that sometimes um, on my social media or my Instagram. I might say, okay, well today, like what color are we looking for today, everyone? And they're like, seafoam green. And they're like, okay. So you share your photos and other people share theirs. And it's a really nice way to kind of breed creativity in your friend group, in your family, right? Like in, you know, people from work, it's a, it's a really easy thing that everyone can kind of jump into, but it's funny because it's sneakily training your brain to search for patterns. And that's, what's funny about it. It's one of those things where by the end of doing it a couple different times, you're going to walk outside or walk around your house and feel very different about your environment. Be much more curious about it, question it, right? Like, why do I have so much blue? What might that make me feel like when I'm relaxing in the living room versus all the yellow in my bedroom? Maybe that's why I can't go to sleep. You know, like it'll start to help you question and think about color and how it is integrated in your life or the lack thereof. Like I had so much trouble finding yellow. I love yellow. Where do I get yellow, right? Like it'll help you with your environment in a different way. I'll also mention that this book, Secret Life of Colors, if you haven't read it or and you're interested in color, it's a really great read that is about the history of colors and kind of the context and like social history of how colors are used. So if you're interested, it's a really good book. All right, we go on to our last activity. If you would like, if you have extra paper, you want to use the back of the paper, you can feel free to doodle any of the things you see in the next couple slides, not required, but feel free. So as far as drawing your slides, what's interesting about, the, drawing your notes, sorry, what's interesting about this, I have two examples here. These are two visual captures that I did for different audiences. What is the difference between a visual capture and drawing your notes? Well, the biggest difference is just the audience. So when you're drawing your own notes, you are that audience, right? We've all taken hand-drawn notes, kind of assuming that you know that hand-drawn notes are much more effective than typed notes. I know we kind of get that pushed out of us a bit in the working world, but do know that hand-drawn is way more effective and way more impactful for our memory and for our understanding. So if you're having trouble with like a topic or there's someone at work that every time they chat, you're like, I really can't understand how they're connecting the dots, you know, drawing or visualizing in real time, even just on your own notepad, personally, is a really great tool to try to unlock that. So what I will say here is 
These are examples, like I mentioned, of visual capture. So the difference is that the audience is for others. So we're just going to talk about what if you visualize your own notes for yourself? Why would you want to do that? So here you see some pieces of science and pieces of social science that really connect to the why behind visuals in your notes. It's rooted in how we learn most effectively. Our brain is going to process visuals that we see way faster than words. So if you draw a timeline, I'm going to know what that means versus if you write the word timeline. And part of that is because the visual cortex is really the largest in the human brain and about 90% of what our brain is consistently picking up is visual. So if you're not using visuals in your work, you're missing out on everyone walking around you, 90% of their brain power, right? If you're not engaging in some way with visuals. The other side of it is that drawing helps us think. We all know this, right? Like when you're really trying to work out a problem, you literally grab a napkin. You're like, here we go. This is what we're thinking about. When you're trying to talk to someone else and they're just not getting it, you draw it out, right? Here to here to here. Um, and the reason that that's helpful is because it's helping our brain kind of break it down and say, how do I communicate this to someone else? And when someone sees that, they're like, okay, this is how they communicated it. It's just a tool. Um, one of the reasons, though, it sticks with us so much stronger than you might even think is because of the effect that pictures have on our brain. Pictures are much more likely to re be remembered than words. And then dual coding theory tells us that words and visuals tightly knitted together. So kind of like on the top middle of this slide, how there's kind of a square with wheels and I have brains process visuals faster than words. That's kind of like a knitted together word and visual. It's going to create a much stronger memory if those visual, if that visual was just words or if it was just a visual. So that content really matters for getting any of these benefits. So if we were to draw our notes, these would be the three steps I would take you through. You would write the words first. And I'll show you an example next, but write those words first. It's really important because you really want to organize within the design elements around the words that you already wrote. So it's not really that impactful to just have like a star on your page unless it says goals my boss cares about star, right? Like you need that context. Once you have the context and once you organize it with design elements, which I'll show you, uh, you want to show the flow. You want to show the arrow from here to here, right? How does the story work? And then you want to repeat this. You want to pick a time of the week or the month or the day that you always have a meeting and you want to practice it over and over because it's a really easy skill set, honestly, to practice and get good at. You just have to practice because we all have handwriting and we've all um, know how to make different shapes. So here is a pretend visual capture with just step one, which is words only. And what I want you to do here, it's kind of meta, right? Because the content of this capture is exactly what we're talking about. But imagine this was your page. And just take about five seconds to think about, if I could draw shapes and use different colors, how would I organize this? How would I make it kind of easier to understand? So I'll be quiet and give you a couple seconds just to visualize what you might add. And I do that because this is something that I personally find myself doing all the time. I draw all of my words first in black, and that gives me the flexibility, whether I'm working on a whiteboard, whether I'm working on my iPad, which is what this was, or just a sheet of paper, or on this huge canvas on stage in front of people. Writing in black, helps people see it when it's on white really easily, and then gives me the flexibility of my whole suite of markers. You know, even if I only have three colors, I can use all those colors to actually add value and help people see this. So I'm gonna go next and know that the way you visualize is not right or wrong, and the way I'm gonna show you is not right or wrong, it's just an option. Okay, so here's an example of what I might add on top of while we're talking about this content so that someone who looks at this, whether it's me or a different audience member, would understand it. 
So I've categorized on the left, you see write your words, it has its own color. I've already used space to kind of keep all that content to the left. Um, when you're writing your words for your notes, you wanna be really clear and simple. You wanna think about impact and why you're writing what you're writing. You wanna synthesize out like all the, the mess and just say, what am I writing about? Like, why am I writing these notes down? Because if it's just, you know, a recording of the video, I can watch that later, especially in our remote time, right? So what is the why? Why are you taking these notes? Why do you need them for later? Who are you giving them to? And then let that kind of help drive what you actually write down. That's the thing that's hardest when I train teams because so you're getting like five minutes on this, but typically I'll work with a team and they might get a whole day just on how to be better visual capturers for themselves and for their team so they can communicate clearer, um, especially in this virtual world where you need to be able to show what you're thinking pretty easily. So just know that if this doesn't make 100% sense, don't worry. Um, it it took me years to figure out any of these things. So this is just a high level. and. If you want to learn more, I have a couple smaller like classes on my site that you can take a look at um, that are about an hour just on this. So if you're like, oh, I'd love to know more, you can go there. If you're like, I would need days on this, you can send me an email, we can talk about it. Um, but basically writing your words is really about being simple, being really intentional, and then having a hierarchy. A hierarchy here is like when you use Microsoft Word, and they have one font for the title and one font for the header and one font for the content, right? It shows the level which your eye should go. It should go to the big ideas first, so they should be biggest. Here you see the three categories. Um, they have numbers too, which is always helpful. And then the smaller the content is, the more it fits under something else, right? It's more kind of um, supportive of that bigger theme or bigger idea. In the middle, you see organize. So there's a box around the organizing category. You see some examples under shapes, color, and space. So design elements, there's many others, but those are really simple ones, right? Even if I just put circles around these categories, that would be a level up and would really help using one design element. Um, but you want to contain similar content. So you want to keep the content near each other that's relevant to each other. Um, and keep some white space. You see those two categories of white space in between categories that maybe aren't super relevant. But the third step is kind of the fix everything step, which is using an arrow or line. So arrows and lines are really impactful because if you just have extra content or an extra idea that doesn't really quite fit, an arrow or a line is a really easy way to show, okay, it doesn't fit in these categories, but maybe it's the you know, around all the categories, or maybe it was really a smaller detail about one of these pieces of content. An arrow is just an easy way that we all understand you're showing me that things are connected. So that is what these are all about. Visualizing your own notes and, and broader what you're experiencing. So maybe you're in a lot of meetings and you just wanna have like kind of one page in your notebook per meeting every day. Maybe you just want to visualize your conversation with your sister every time she calls each week, right? Like that type of active activation of visualizing your experience helps you better understand that experience and make sense of it. But the bonus is that it also helps you communicate it, helps you explain it to others, and helps you share it, right? It's an immediate, hey, this was my takeaway. And when I work with clients, they're usually most interested in that takeaway or the understanding in the room, right? The kind of let's all get on the same page. Let's all really understand what we're talking about and not talk past each other on email for weeks and weeks and weeks. So that's important too. Now, I think my next slide is my bonus slide. So I wanted to just share a little bit before that. Um, those were the three activities. Again, you can do them every day. You can kind of schedule when you want to try them. Maybe your weekends are right when you want to kind of add these into your routine. All, all I'd say is that I have found personally that when I work these into my routine, meaning maybe my ritual is to wake up, have coffee, and do a blind contour, even if it's just that much, 30 seconds, it helps my brain kind of get ready for the day in a way that checking my email or looking at the news right away doesn't. So if you're looking for kind of a good reset, 
these are activities that are really um, able to be kind of flexible. Like you don't have to start on Monday, right? Like you could do a color story tomorrow, color of the day tomorrow, and you know, try it once a week, right? You can, you can do whatever you need. Um, the most important thing is to repeat these things. So even if it's uncomfortable the first couple times, you want to learn about yourself, right? You want to learn about how you observe something. When do you get tired of looking at an orange? Is it after 10 seconds or 50 seconds, right? How do you really reach that flow state? Or, you know, for the color of the day, what is the color you see the most of in your home all the time, right? That's like a data point that you could research the heck out of later like oh that might be why i'm tired all the time in this room or that's why i'm really interested in this type of content in this room right there's plenty of kind of googling you can do after that and then with the visual notes it's really impactful and important to think about why you're joining calls generally right we're on calls all the time we have so many different calls at our disposal to join and learn from, visual notes are a great way to say, well, this is why I joined, this is what my takeaways were, and oh, by the way, I remember and understand it even better because I did this for myself. But that said, you can still do all of that and still feel really stuck. There might be days where you're like, not feeling creative, this is terrible. And when that happens, this is my go-to list of what I change personally when I need a spark. So I think we've all been there where you might be trying to work on the same problem or the same question for days. You're like, I don't have a response. I don't know how to email this person back, you know, or I just don't have a creative idea to send back to Kat when she asked me to do this activity, right? Like those moments where you're like, I want to show up and I want to respond, but I'm not happy with what I've come up with, right? Changing these things, your environment, so physically where you are, whether that's a walk or whether that's taking a weekend and staying somewhere different, going to a different environment for the afternoon, changing rooms, any of those things count. Really changing what you're seeing all the time can be a huge spark that helps you kind of elevate and change what you're doing. Perspective. So as simple as literally, I can't think of anything to say in this email. I've read it a thousand times. It still doesn't make sense. Let me lay on the floor and look up at the ceiling. Let me go in the other room and imagine if all the furniture was on the ceiling, right? Like just change up where you physically are. Go stand on a roof and look down. Get a different perspective. Noise is kind of simple because, you know, we have the music we like, but especially living in New York, sometimes you don't realize kind of the white noise that's happening all the time. So changing up your noise setting, whether that's listening to different music, different nature sounds, going out into nature, closing a window if you're hearing sirens and you don't realize you're hearing sirens. Um, similar with scent, right? We have certain scents that we're very used to. You know, what happens if I cut open a grapefruit and leave that on my desk when I'm trying to figure out kind of a hairy problem, right? We all know that, like citrus scent. Or what if I light a candle? What if I change my scent that way? And then medium, which is how are you solving the problem you're working on? The biggest one for me is whenever I'm working in like, I can't say Excel because my husband works at uh, Google Sheets. So Google Sheets um, or an Excel-like model. Um, if I'm working in like those tiny squares, I'm a mess. I can't figure, I'm like, I don't know what I'm trying to do. But if I change the pencil and paper first and I'm like, okay, these are the things I'm trying to track or these are the things I'm trying to work through, um, I'm able to do it so much better and easier if I then switch back to a different medium. So those are kind of my extra special changes that I make whenever I'm working through something that I kind of need an extra jolt of creativity. And with that, thank you for coming. I'm gonna pass it back to Kat. Um, but if you're interested in seeing more examples or you're interested in seeing classes or resources, that's my site. I'll definitely share this with everyone. I think tomorrow morning when I get the email list, so you'll have this in your inbox on Friday just to kind of go back through and have some more insights. But I'd love to hear any thoughts or questions now or later about how the session went. And with that, Cal, I'll hand it to you and see if there's any kind of burning questions. Well, thanks so much, Zara. We do have a lot of questions that are piling in. So some of them we may not get to. Um, 
but that was great. I definitely felt uncomfortable even in the 30 second or plus um, first exercise. So I was testing myself for sure. Um, so the first question that came in, Zara, was um, for blind contour drawing. Does it matter if you're doing it on paper or electronically with a stylus, um, with a tablet? I would say it doesn't matter as long as you treat the tablet just like you treat a paper, meaning don't go back and like clean it up, right? Leave it as raw and kind of unthin it as, as you create it. Okay, great. Um, so the next one that came in was, can you do the color of the day exercise with things besides colors? So maybe words or phrases or sounds? Yeah, absolutely. I love the idea of sounds, like all these little audio messages of like hearing similar sounds. I think you can get as uh, expansive or creative as it fits with your situation. I think words is really interesting because we see words in such different um, ways every day, whether it's on a screen or elsewhere. Uh, color is an easy one to start with, I would say, but absolutely, you could add in any type. I'd say just pick, like you shared in the question, it was already perfectly explained, you know, pick a, a thing, um, even if it's just, I want to look for anything that's patterned, right? Like something that's very specific so you don't find yourself photographing everything um, or searching and finding a lot of something. So keep it kind of specific, but yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay, and the next one is how much prep is needed for visual capture? Um, if you're doing it for someone else, like your team or a client, I would say there's quite a bit and I spend a lot of time with my training on how to prep because it's not just physical stuff like you need paper and markers or whatever. It's about like, how do you, are you really ready to understand the conversation? Have you reviewed, you know, context or notes or slides or whatever? That said, um, if you're doing it for yourself, if you're just like, hey, I want to try this out, or you, you're doing it at a low stakes, like a team meeting that everyone is going to be supportive and you're not getting basically paid for it, where you have to be like really gung-ho great, um, I would say take as many risks as you feel most comfortable. And, you know, putting yourself in front of people pretty early as you're practicing is going to help because that art critique is something everyone kind of has innately, like they're going to share their feedback and you want that feedback because you'll get better from that feedback. Um, but I will say there's, I personally put quite a bit of kind of planning in front of it because uh, for it to be what a client might need strategically, it's very specific to their situation. If it's just for me and I'm just taking my visual notes, I can do it with a pen and paper one day. Other days I might do it digitally. Other days I might try to add some new stuff in. So start there first, but um, I'm happy to take like specific questions later if you have like a specific example of when you're trying to do it. Okay, and the next one, I think this is related to exercise three. Um, do you have to, you know, actually draw um, what you're expressing or could you go out and find visuals to show these ideas, especially if you're not sure if people would be able to understand your drawing? So I err on the side of you drawing because if you go back, if I go back to that slide, let me just see if I can go back. Um, oops, let's see. Okay. Like, I would, I'd be hard pressed to find someone on this call that can't draw a cloud or a box or an arrow, right? Like that's all we're showing right here. And that's very intentional. Like that's how I started. You do not need, and that's how I still continue to do a lot of live stuff. Like if I'm on a call with a client, I'm just trying to jot down the ideas and show them to say, hey, I understood what you're talking about. Like this is the level of detail. So what I would say to you is, It'll take a lot more effort to go find a cloud shape from PowerPoint, bring it in, you know, make it perfect, than you on your piece of paper just practicing a couple times, like two or three shapes that you want to start using, whether it's clouds or squares or different lines. And trust yourself, right? Like all of us grew up drawing as kids, and that gets stripped away a little bit each year that we don't practice it. 
But I promise you, if you start to bring it back into your daily life, it is like riding a bike. You will remember it and you will find yourself practicing things that aren't on the slide, right? Practicing other shapes that you start noticing, right? They are like, I can draw a pyramid. Let me put that in my next capture. Um, so be very creative about it and don't limit yourself at the beginning because I feel like you probably have low expectations, but that's natural and normal for something you haven't tried yet. Um, but I would say kind of trust yourself. And I've seen so many people walk into my trainings saying I'm not creative. And I'm talking like all ages, right? From high schoolers to like CEOs of companies. And they're like, I'm not creative. I can't do it. I'm not a drawer. And by the end, they're like, I cannot believe I did that. Because it is very simple things coming together that are much more impactful than me drawing, you know, a portrait of someone. That's not what this practice is about. It's much more about being very responsive to what you're hearing and simplifying, like keeping it as simple as possible at the beginning, for sure. Well, we do have a lot more questions piling in, Sarah, so I think we'll have to get those to you after since we're coming to the end of our time. And that way, you know, I know you're reaching out to everyone tomorrow with your contact information so folks can keep the questions coming. Did you have a final slide you wanted to share, Sarah? I just wanted to end on this so folks could get my contact if they want to take a look now or if they have an email question they want to shoot to me, that's my email address. I'll respond there. Um, and if you have questions that you're just worried aren't going to get answered elsewhere that are burning, feel free to reach out there. But like Kat said, she'll get me all the questions and I'll be happy to respond to them. But I really appreciate there being any questions. I told Kat, if there aren't any questions, will you have some for me? And she's like, no, I think there will be questions. So more than enough. Um, well, thank you everyone so much for joining. Thank you, Zara. And um, for other virtual events that are going on for William and Mary alums, you can go to wmalumni.com um, and you'll be able to attend events from around the country, which is different than what we normally can do. So I guess one positive during this time. Um, so thank you all. Thank you. Bye, Kat.